Good afternoon, everyone. While waiting for this microphone to settle down, um, I can relax from, I don't know, all these shattering words that you said to me. This is hopefully not quite true. What I want to do with you is take you on a journey uh, that has something to do with electrochemistry and material science. And that should show you also that we have to be careful with traditional views how we we define our problems and how we, de we define our systems. Um, because we, we tend to, un to think that scientists should try to understand things and they do this best by cutting a little bit of nature and making a model of it and fixing this model in space and time and try to analyze it quantitatively, rigorously, and then say we make now an extrapolation back into real life. And if I can convey you this message after this presentation, you might understand that this is not always the best way of doing things. Okay, having said this, um, I want to, to go into my real subject. So, operando analysis of electrochemical water splitting, and I have chosen oxygen evolution reaction, well knowing that that's the wrong reaction, because in this institute I should have talked about AGR, that we could also do, but the, the problem of OAR is simply the more demanding one if you want to do water splitting. It's simply that's the reason why I chose it. Um, operando analysis um, is a very fancy word these days, and I also give you some warning. Most of the things that people think it is operando is actually not operando because they do not verify that while they observe the object, it's really working. It's not so easy to observe the simultaneous function of the system and the spectroscopic analysis. Having said this, I would like to thank, of course, the co-workers. It was very clearly said there is quite a few of them. Um, not all of them contributed to the project that I'm going to report here. This is just these people, these are the postdocs who worked on this, and the three that I have colored here in blue are the ones who gave most of the real the good ideas with this. Um, but this is, even that little part of our activity is quite a big collaborative project. So collaboration, team spirit, and cooperation inside the department is extremely important for our work. It was, I'm very glad that you pointed this so strongly out. Um, these are my group leaders. These people are essentially doing the work. I'm standing here and trying to entertain you a little bit. And you might know this capacity, this guy, uh, with his team we have also a long collaboration that is up and down, up and down, but also he contributed to some of the ideas. Also, personally saying in this concept, he is my opponent, so he would not like to, um, to say what I'm saying now. So we are we're having a scientific fight over that, which is fine. Okay, what's the issue? If you do <laughs> proton, uh, proton um, membrane and water splitting, then you know that this is a, a technology, and you know it has some, some relevance, and as I introduced, the most difficult thing is the oxygen evolution reaction of this, and the only useful catalyst that I can use for this is iridium oxide. And we got interested because we want not improve the system, that is not the point, but we want to understand why is iridium so single? Why is there only iridium that actually can do it? And the hope is if we understand this, then we can take a decision, is there a future in PEM electrolysis or not? because you have to scale this up to global dimensions, and if you do it on a wrong system, then maybe this is a significant waste of time and the resources. So you should better have a scientific reasoning, is this the right technology or not? The technology is seen here, and so this has already reached a certain dimension. And I just took this image because it comes from First Alpine, and this is close to here, so I take any of these things. It's also a good image because it shows the the real structure of the whole problem, and within these many plates that you can see, you also know there is iridium oxide. Now, science, as I said, is, this is a model of iridium oxide. This is so-called rutile structure, IRO2, very well known. So I omit all these little details because I'm expecting here a highly educated audience, and I think you all know this. The point that I want to make is one sees the critical steps. There are water molecules. There is a peroxo species on it and there's a very rigid structure. And then you ask yourself, mm, if you change now the number of electrons in these systems, can this really be that this happens in this rigid structure? The answer is yes, if it's a metal, it's no problem because you have the Fermi C and there you can change the electrons plus or minus one, there's no, no matter, that's not a problem. 
But that's not a conventional metal. This is a covalently bonded metal. And there is essentially nothing like a Fermi Z. That means if you change the electronic structure of any one of these atoms, you also simultaneously have to change the coordination number because you have to break a covalent bond. And that is something that is not, it is not clear to everyone when one discusses this. Metals are something very different from compounds in this respect because you cannot easily change the electronic structure of compounds. You cannot change the electronic structure of molecules, but you can change the electronic structure of metals because of this unique property that you are allowed to move around the electrons essentially for free. And that is a very important thing that is not usually taken into account also when people start making theories about how that works. You remember they do kinetic theory and then they write star plus something happens. A voice star, that's the rest of this presentation. In the end of my presentation, I give you my view of what star is. Okay, this is what we have to do. What we learn from practice is a good catalyst is a complex nanostructure of iridium oxide. The worst catalyst that you can make is bulk iridium oxide. You crystallize it, you make a perfect crystal, you look at the x ray diffraction, you give a quantitative analysis, IRO 2.00, and the reactivity in OER is zero. It's completely inactive. Uh -huh. Interesting. That means the catalytic activity that we are interested in is not an intrinsic property of IRO2, but it's an extrinsic property of the defect structure of IRO2. That's not the same thing. The catalyst gives a stable contribution to the total overpotential, equal contribution of the membrane and electron conduction. Why I'm saying this? Because there are thousands of papers that say we have to develop a new material in order to make the efficiency of this, of this electrode better. No, I doubt this. I'll show you in a moment why. Degradation of this beautiful thing that you also see downstairs is about 30 millivolts per month. Now you say, well, 30 millivolts per month, academically, you, you don't you laugh at this. How can you measure that? But when you imagine what is a year, and see it's 12 months, and then you say, oh, that's 0.4 volts. That is enormous. So that, that, that is not working. And it is 10 times faster in static operation. That means if you leave this running all the time, then this degrades rather rapidly. Whoever has done iridium oxide in the lab, you will see this. Sometimes this is already gone after one day. Um, an interesting question, why is this dependent so much on the time scale? How do you operate this? That calls for hmm, maybe some dynamic phenomena. So this indicates material dynamics and calls for more analysis. So this is a detective story. Why is this so unstable? In order to look at this first thing, what, what one does normally is this easy impedance spectroscopy of the electrode. And one sees if you increase the current density, and you do this here not in academic current densities, but in real ones, because then one sees what the span of phenomena is. This is not, we are not interested in the scientific application. We are interested in getting a, a, a huge parameter space. And then you see the, the, the catalyst, which is the yellow, the, the, the light blue one, essentially does not change much with, with current density. So this is a non-ohmic behavior. But it's all the other components of the electrode. This is simple ohmic resistance, what you see there. So nothing special. Take home message is nothing you can do about this because it's ohmic behavior. OK, it's ohmic behavior. And the statement <coughs> that there is too much overpotential in the system because the catalyst is not good enough mm -mm, is not right. That is not our problem. Yet there are many papers that say, oh, we have to improve the catalyst. No, you do not. You have to improve possibly the catalyst because of lifetime, but that is not on that graph. That's a different story. So how do we start? We start at the beginning, how do we make iridium oxide? And then we find it's not so easy to make iridium oxide because normally you take a metal iron and you put a precipitation agent and then you precipitate it and the oxide comes out of it. Not for iridium because iridium precipitates not by condensation, by polycondensation, but by disproportionation. That means in the moment you make iridium oxide, you parallel also make iridium metal. And this is unavoidable. And you can't see normally because most of this material is amorphous. So when you do X-ray analysis, you, by powder extract, you don't see this. But you see it when you make a full chemical analysis. And if you want to make phase pure iridium dioxide, then the, what you have to do is heavy calcination. 
And then you find that iridium oxide is a sponge for oxygen because at atmospheric pressure, you cannot even convert it to iridium dioxide. You need about 10 bar of dioxygen pressure to make stoichiometric iridium oxide. That tells you already, mm, iridium dioxide as rutile is possibly not what we want. We don't even get it. But that is a very strong hint to the suitability of iridium oxide as water splitter because it tells us that oxygen binds very weakly to iridium. That's a perfect idea if you want to make an oxygen evolution catalyst. You should have this. Analysis very quickly. Um, this is temperature programmed analysis. What we use and you see this is very unusual for an oxide that at 60 degrees centigrade you get a reduction to metal. So normal oxides need way higher temperatures than this. And I have shown you also in this little red box what, what stoichiometric iridium dioxide does. So this is way less stable than stoichiometric iridium oxide. Fine. Of course, one can quantify the whole thing and can determine the amount of water that is in this system, which shouldn't be there because it's called iridium dioxide, but in reality, it's more iridium OOH times water. And as you change the kinetics of precipitation, you drastically change also the formula of the system. That is the reason why there's this dark science, how do you make this electrode material? This is very critical, and of course, all the different manufacturers of these electrodes have lots of secrets around this. The answer is in this, because you see some of it is an oxide that is an hydrous oxide, that's okay, but as I said, some of them contain also metal and oxide and, and OH groups and water. So this is quite a complicated thing, and it is far away from saying it's a rutile structure. Um, let's go a little bit deeper, put this in the microscope. When you put a working electrode in the microscope, then you see at medium resolution this crappy electron micrograph. You see in nanoparticles where you see the lattice fringes, that is normal, we would expect this, and then you see this hazy stuff on top of it. Now, if you say, Schlügel, why can't you make a proper electron micrograph? I, I am not a good microscopist. Yes, we, I think we are better microscopists than this. But if you try to make the resolution better, then what happens is you destroy this iridium hydroxide and you find the electron micrograph of iridium metal. And about 90% of all of the papers that show you the electron micrograph of an iridium oxide electrode indeed show you the electron micrograph of an iridium metal particle, not of the oxide. This is not so easy to find because the lattice parameters are not so different. When you do this a little bit differently, then you can resolve this hazy stuff and then you see this is not amorphous, but this has this supramolecular structure. And those of who you who are crystallographers or know about something inorganic structure, then immediately you recognize what that is. This is the structural motif of hollandite that you see there. This is channel structure stuff. Man manganese oxides, hundreds of them have this structure. It's a very well-known structural motif. This is the top of the electrode, far away from rutile. But we expect this because the chemical composition is also not rutile. Okay, what's the material science behind this? We analyze the structure, of course, and then we see iridium oxygen distance, and we see edge sharing octahedra and corner sharing octahedra, and then, of course, we look at different morphologies of well-working and not-so-well-working materials, and it turns out that the, the good material that is really working very well is the one that is, has this pure hollandite motif. This is our actual catalyst. But don't go then and say, oh, we buy now hollandite and have a better catalyst. Of course, hollandite is a, as a crystalline material is as inactive as rutile. It doesn't do anything. So it's just the disordered form of it, and you need the local structure analysis of hollandite, not the translational structure of it. The translational structure, whatever you do, is bad for the performance. So this is a local phenomenon. That makes you think, mm, that is not so nice because you want to transfer lots of electrons through this, so there has to be a metallic conductance. There's a backside contact how you do the current collection. That is not so good if this is a local structure only because the ohmic conductivity of this thing will not be very good. What you can learn from this immediately, the successful catalyst must be a combination of several things because it has several functions. It has a function of collecting electrons and has a function of collecting oxygen in OH groups, and that's not the same thing. So it's a bifunctional system. All right. Now comes this question. This is still famous, and there is lots of publication. What is the oxidation state of iridium? And of course, you know, iridium dioxide is very obvious, 4+. Plus. That's the only stable oxidation state that the iridium has. When you look at the iridium chemistry, it's in, in molecules, it's 3+, plus, and in the compounds, it's 4+. Plus. 
that's normal. But this is a composite structure. So what is the oxidation state of a composite structure? That could be interesting. And then we find indeed when we do standard analysis by photo emission, this is a simple thing. Ah, it's all interesting. Iridium 3.75, what is that? That's nothing. That's useless. And you see the difference between a good and a bad iridium electrode is from iridium 3.75 to iridium 3.8. Mm. That's also not good. And when you look at the spectrum, they say, my goodness, why is this so complicated? This is a long story where I could spend quite some time. It took us about two years to unravel why this, this spectrum is so diffuse and complicated because it has satellites that come from the fact that if you change the atomic, atomic structure of iridium and produce a core hole there, then there is a complete breakdown of the electronic structure of the system. That is common to many heavy atoms in the periodic table. So silver and thallium also have this phenomenon, but it was not so well known that also iridium has this problem. And that is the reason why I get so many satellite structures. This is simply, this is a spectroscopic artifact. It has nothing to do with the ground state of it. That's all fine. What I want to show in the main graph is that there is a significant improvement or change in the performance of the system depending on the kinetics of precipitation. So the x-axis is KOH to iridium precipitation to iridium ratio, and that has something to do with how fast does this precipitate. This is a detail. And you see that the, the, the current uh, carrying capability as well as the lifetime of these electrodes critically depend on the kinetics. This is where, for example, the company Umicore makes a lot of money out in order to optimize this. We had a collaboration with Umico over five years or so, and they were quite happy finding such things. So now a word about operando analysis. If you want to do operando analysis, then of course it's good to do this on a synchrotron. That is fine, but you want to do this in water. Mm. Synchrotron with electron spectroscopy in water, every one of you who owns a UHV system would do all kinds of things, but never put water in the UHV system. That is really dangerous, and this is very difficult to perform this. It also took us about a decade to build an instrument that can perform this in water. And even if you have this, then you have still quite a few problems. And the worst problem is that, of course, X-rays and water react with each other. So radiolysis is a very well-known phenomenon. And that is, of course, the enemy of all of these experiments. And, of course, there's this problem of information depth. You are interested in this top layer of this Hollandite stuff, and you are not interested in the rutile. The rutile is easy to find. So when you do XRF, so anything high energy X-ray application, then you always find iridium 4 plus rutile backward and forward. But it's not what you are interested in because you know there is this termination layer. So the reaction environment is critical. So we built this machine. It's a long story, a really long story, with many people were, in, were involved in this. And there were the green one where the synchrotron comes and the red one where the analyzer is, and the blue one comes together there as the specimen location. And there we have our little iridium sample. That you really are convinced that we're doing this, you see down there the flask with the material, and you see this, this little hose, and this little hose really pumps the water into the UHV system. Not something that you would normally want to do, but it works. The world has developed four different methods to solve this problem. How can we study photoelectron spectroscopy in water? And I have given you here the four methods. And one can see none of them is good because some of them have advantages and all of them have disadvantages. That means it is not a good idea to do any one of these methods, but you need probably several of them. And we had invented the bottom three ones. They don't come from our group. And what I will show you is experiments from these two because they are really, really useful. Early work, as I said, that's the top method. One sees the electrochemical cell, and one sees where this classic carbon lit is. This is the boundary layer between the vacuum and the, the electrochemical water system. And of course, the, the core issue is, of course, to use this, this proton exchange membrane that we have here also as something that changes the pressure between many orders of magnitude in the water and the vacuum. And then, of course, the details are how do you get a catalyst there that you can put the X-rays on this and you get photoelectrons emitting from that. That's also not simple, um, but this is doable. I show you just here some, some details about this. And to make this short, we didn't test this with iridium because at the time it was too difficult to get this iridium for, to work. And I will, no, I will not explain it. No time. No, no, no time. 
in a short way, platinum, that is also very well known to all of you. This is a very useful system in electrochemistry. And this is also, this is a very bad OER catalyst, as you all know. And this is a bad OER catalyst because under these conditions, platinum is completely oxidized to platinum 4 plus. But unfortunately, you can't see this because at the moment when you change the potential, the platinum 4 plus disappears and it goes back to platinum metal. That means if you put an electrode under operation conditions, it's platinum 4 plus. If you switch off the potential, you can't be as fast as you see this, it's back to platinum metal. This is why it's noble. We have lots of slides, we have published this all in detail, but it's not relevant here because we want to do iridium here. Okay, the question is, does this also happen with iridium? And then we found the coexistence of metallic and oxidic iridium as we found in the ex situ analysis, we also found in operation. Okay, fine. But the interesting question then is, mm, where are our protons? Because we have discussed so far only oxygen, and we have discussed iridium, but we have not discussed water. And of course, you need to resolve the water. And then the interesting question is, everybody discusses this oxidation state. And I'm, I'm a chemist, and as a chemist, I know if you put, if you say iridium is in the active phase, iridium 5 plus, I just say no, never ever. Iridium 5 plus simply doesn't exist rather than in fluorine matrices, but never in water. So forget this. Whatever spectroscopy tells you this is iridium 5 plus, there's a problem with it. And that was one of the motivations that we had. And to cut a long story short, and this is, of course, not very didactical, but it helps you understanding this, an oxidation reaction not necessarily also can happen on a metal. It can also happen on a ligand. There's nothing wrong with saying, why do you not oxidize oxygen minus 2 to oxygen minus 1? This is, of course, this is foreign thinking. Most people would never think about it. This is possible. Of course it is possible, and I will show you, yes. And this is exactly what happens here. So could it be that oxyl is the spectator? Oxyl is the oxygen minus one species of oxo. Oxo, you all know, is oxygen minus two. Now here are a few spectra, and the, the first thing that, you, that we noticed, and that, that was the beginning of the whole story, is when you look at this top spectrum at so-called 2.5 volts, then you find there's a complicated uh, pre-feature that happens in the next subspectrum where this, these two dashed lines are, and there's this little thing, and that doesn't belong there. So when you look at the spectrum, it's foreign, this is not correct, because we all know how the next subspectrum of oxides look, and there is nothing at 528 volt. It simply has never been observed before. Brackets never, no, has been observed before. It has observed before in high temperature superconductors. Ah, ah interesting. What well, have high temperature superconductors to do with, with electrodes? In the end, you will see uh, quite a bit. And then we verified that this little blip is indeed responsible for the performance, so we did in operando experimentation. We looked at the intensity of this little additional feature that you find in the, in the lower graph as a function of applied potential. And don't laugh about the voltages. This was an experiment where we didn't have a reference electrode, and this is the reason why the voltages are all off. But that's a technical detail that we have cured by now quite well. <coughs> Consequences, yes, oxyl has something to do with the reaction. Ah, well, that's good. So is this true that oxygen oxidation state is no minus two? Yes, the answer is, we did a lot of theory in order to verify this, and the answer is, it is indeed possible. You see here the calculated and the measured spectrum in red for real rutile that we made, and in blue for our catalyst. And we see, in theory, as an experiment, yes, there's an additional signal. And this additional signal is not in the iridium spectrum, but it's in the oxygen spectrum. Uh, that is not so common. People usually do not measure oxygen spectra because this is so difficult. Imagine you measure oxygen spectra in water. That's not trivial. And then when you do this as a function of performance, then one sees the same thing. This iridium oxide SA is our reference material. It's completely inactive for OER. Then this uh, RR iridium oxide that's very well known to the experts. This is alpha ethers iridium oxide, which is a terrible mixture between metal and oxyhydroxide. That is a catalyst that works. And the blue ones are our homemade catalysts. And this MW5 is the best catalyst. And as one can see, it has the highest intensity of the additional feature. Okay, another indication could be interesting. Now the question is, this is an integral measurement over the whole electrode. What happens is this locally also the case? So we refer to the idea, can we do this also in the electron microscope and do the oxygen KH spectrum in eels? Because the same technique, but that is local, because we can see the atom from which this eel spectrum comes from. 
And the answer is, yes, it's exactly the same. This is the short answer to, to that. And then we started collaboration with theory, and then we looked at it, what, what is oxyl? And is oxyl really oxygen minus one? And of course, one can do EPR spectroscopy on the system, and then one finds, hmm, no, it's not so simple, because the spin density map indicates that Indeed, this electron density is not only at oxygen, so it's not oxygen minus one radical, but this is oxygen minus one radical plus a lot of the electron density somewhere in this iridium. Consequence, of course, and this is a chemist would understand this immediately, this is a covalent bond. This is not ionic. That is the simple answer of all of this. No surprise, really. So how many oxygen species are there? And then we find, oh, there are many. So there's, of course, lattice oxygen from the iridium oxide. Yeah, clear. This is why it's an oxide. There's water as a reagent, and clear. This is an electrochemical reaction. There's water as a solvation species because you have to bring the water from the electro electrolyte, of course, to the reagent. So it has to be coordinated. This, for example, will never happen on a metal. There is no metal on this planet that really absorbs water. It's only the dirt of the metal that absorbs the water. Clean metals don't do that. Clear why. There's OH. Okay, that is also with the dissociate water is the next thing that happens. You have OH. And then, of course, you have all kinds of things that we found in this Hollandite. So all the defects, they're also different. So you see, quite a few. And then, of course, when you do this only in vacuum, you don't see all of the species. You see only a few of them. And that is the reason why there's a huge debate in the literature. How is the interpretation of this spectra? There is no dispute. It is simply the complexity is overlooked. You have to look into the whole system, then you see all the peaks. So is this water needed? And unfortunately, I have to tell you, yes, urgently. And if you, if you measure these things, these electrodes without water, you measure something which is very interesting, but it's not relevant. So there are a few spectra to show you the complexity of the system. This is iridium oxide in vacuum at the bottom. Then it's clear, clean water on top of it. And if, of course, you combine now iridium in water, then you should see this, this spectroscopic sum of the two spectra. And you see almost the spectroscopic sum. But again, you see this additional green little feature that you see that we observed also experimentally. So yes, there is some reaction. And this does not require a potential. Even just if you put iridium oxide in water, it happens already. Of course, we can do the theory. So this, the colored peaks are now the theoretical predictions where all these species are. And of course, this is very nice that we have this, this science that we call now computational spectroscopy. So we can really predict where these things are. And we do not have to do reference experiments, which we did in the past. And then the agreement is very nice. And you see again, that is very tiny little green, light green feature. This has something to do with the reaction. OK, it's a, whoa, such a small signal. This is only a little blip there. Is this really relevant? I will show you now a few slides. Yes, it is relevant. This is the relevant thing. So the most active form of iridium oxide is an iridium hydroxide. And then we went at long to make a model material. Also, I said, you should not do that. But we did not make a rutile. We made iridium OOH. This did not be. This was a group that in, in Stuttgart at the, at, at the Max Planck Institute, and we had a great help from them. Um, and what they did in order to synthesize this is the same thing what happens also in the electrolyte when you just take iridium oxide with some defects and just put it in your electrolyte. And this happens by itself. What it transforms to is this layered structure. And this layered structure has an interlayer water. And the, uh, the, con the concentration of this interlayer water and the protons that are associated with it, they determine the oxidation state. OK, that is easy to understand. There's also a beautiful structure. This is called heteronychinite, this material. That's very nice. It has a beautiful name. Um, it also has a proper structure. You can analyze this. And here's now the electronic structure of this. And the take home message is at the, at the plot number D. Again, you see the same as what we observed, uh, what we observed in our experiments. There's this little added feature. It comes again. And it comes as a function of the non stoichiometry of the amount of water in the interlayer space. Oh, that is interesting. That is what we want to know. You also see in plot number C, when you look at the iridium spectrum, you see almost nothing from this. Of course not, because iridium is always 4 plus. This is iridium, OK? You cannot change this. The, the, the story of redox chemistry in iridium oxide does not happen at the iridium, but it happens at the oxygen. And if you don't look at the oxygen, you can't see. 
And in the top plot A and B, you see the density of states of this material under different conditions. In the top, you see this is a semiconductor. If it is an intact oxyhydroxide, you would expect this. But it becomes a metal if you just take out from the semiconductor one layer. So remove everything, you exfoliate it in a single slab, and then it's a metal. And if you deprotonate it, so you take the protons away from it, it becomes a semiconductor again. Oh, that, that's bad. But remember what we showed, what we saw in the electron micrograph was this holandite motif. This holandite motif is nothing else than a very small section of what you see here. So this is the extended version of it. And what I really would like you to, to, to take home with is how much does in, in panel A, how much does the electronic structure change if you play around with the protons? You would say, this is, can't be, protons is so, so little, this is one electron. And this big iridium atoms is all of these electrons there. But it makes a decisive difference in the electronic structure. And that tells us again, this is certainly not an ionic material, because there it wouldn't make any difference. The modeling energy of the things are the same. It is really covalently bonded, and this, this reminds us very much on molecules, because molecules also have this property. Small changes in the atomic composition, big change in the electronic structure. Same here. So, liquid water, that is an interesting thing. I told you it is necessary to put liquid water in there. So how on earth would we verify that under these experiments where we do it, there is really liquid water present? Because we always have the vacuum that pumps away, of course, the water. And it took us many years to build this system in such a way that it works. And of course, you can think about what is necessary as an experimentalist to take a monolayer of graphene, take it with a tweezer, and put it on top of an electrode that you have spotted on, on some, some nafion. This is a nightmare of synthetic chemistry. You have to be super patient in order to do that. And you make this 100 times and it works once. So this is absolutely non-trivial to do such an experiment. And I show there's a lots of details on this, which is not necessary. The take-home message is the following. Of course, everything in the system contains oxygen. So how on earth would we be able to find this little bit of extra oxygen that is associated with the reaction? This is this red curve. This is the difference that you get when you have the whole system without iridium and with iridium dry and wet. And this, this tiny difference in this red spectrum again shows this extra little peak at low energies. But you can think this is synchrotron spectroscopy with everything on resolution that we can find on this planet. And we get this little thing. So in a laboratory experiment, no way that you could ever see such things. And this tells us why it is necessary to put all this effort and bring this machine to the synchrotron, take 10 million euros and build for five years such a beamline in order to see this little thing. I only say this because otherwise you might be surprising why didn't many other people see this. Yeah, who has such a machine? Not so many people. But this is not nice to have it, it is essential to have it. Now, does it really work? This is now your question. Say, Schlügel, I tell all these fancy things. This is, how do you prove that it works? Yes, it works. Because we can detect the little amount of oxygen that we form with this little specimen while we shine X-rays on. And that also proves that we do not do this by radiolysis. Because if we now switch on the potential and switch off the potential, oxygen has to be more or less. And if there's continuous oxygen, then it's radiolysis. So we can do this, yes. It works. You can see in the middle our potential change. You get the current response of the system and you get the oxygen from the mass spectrometer. Huh? Fine, it works. There are some differences, and the differences are clear to everyone who does electrochemistry. You see, of course, the dissolution of oxygen in the electrolyte. That is why it has this rise curve. And then it has something which is more intricate in this. When you compare the, the potential and the current curve, then you see, of course, what you call capacity peak. That is very well known. But there is more to this, because there's this slow, this, this slow thing that is disappearing. You electro electrochemists know this. You call this pseudo-capacity. Uh, what, what on hell, what on earth is pseudo capacity? That's a strange thing. That's not pseudo. And that gives an important hint how this actually the system works. So we spend a lot of time trying to analyze why is the blue curve not identical with the, with the green curve minus the two peaks that we would expect from the electrostatic charging of the system. And indeed, that was the, this is the answer. So spectroscopic identification, yes, we can do this, that we have seen now. 
But now I want to show you in operando how that works. In the green box, you see on top the iridium spectrum and on the bottom the oxygen nexus in the range where this little peak is. And then, of course, when you come from open circuit potential and you start with a metal, then you see a shift because you oxidize the iridium to iridium 4 plus. Fine. Nothing special about this. This is when you do the cycle Walter Gramm, then you see this is this first peak where everybody says it's oxidation. Yeah, we see that too. Then when you go from, from after this first peak into the area just before where oxygen evolution starts, then we are in this yellow box. And then we see some interesting. The iridium spectrum shows almost no change. It gets a little bit broader. But the oxygen spectrum changes drastically because we see the appearance of our little peak. And we see now in high resolution that this is two peaks. Uh -huh. We have to explain why that too. Then we go into operation conditions. This is OAR. This is the blue box. And then we see again no change in iridium. Iridium doesn't know whether it works or not, so you can't see it there. But in oxygen, you see again one of these peaks stays constant, no change. And the other one, this little tiny one, that half disappears when you put it in operation. And that is a very good indication that that has something to do with the reaction because something that has to do with the reaction must not pile up but must disappear. Otherwise, it's not kinetically relevant because if you have more conversion, of course, you should see less of this stuff that is on the surface that makes it. Theory, again, helps a lot to assign this. And what you see here is, something, again, something very interesting, what I showed you already with this heterogeneite. The electronic structure and so also the electronic structure of the excited state of the system depends enormously on the protonation stage. You see, in the deprotonated state, one sees the single oxygen spectrum is this green line, the double coordinated oxygen is the red line, and the, the bulk uh, lattice oxygen is the yellow line. Of course, the lattice oxygen does not change if you protonate or deprotonate because there's no proton and it does no change. When you go then from deprotonated to partly protonated, then you see also the double oxygen spectrum does essentially very little change. But the single coordinated oxygen disappears. Ah. This is the one that was in the interlayer space of this heterogeneite. That's the same species. That is the relevant one. What happens during a reaction? Now we do this again in operando. So we change in the top the potential. And what you see is just a part of a cyclic voltammogram. You ramp up the current, and then you ramp it down to the, the potential. This is the, the top blue line. And then you see this oxidation peak. That's all, all fine. And then we can set our spectrometer under such conditions that we observe one of the two peaks. This is the, the this trace B. And this little one that changes its intensity is trace C. And then we measure the intensity as a function of potential. So we ramp up the spectrum, and, and we ramp up the potential, and we look at the intensity of these peaks. And you see for yourself how what the agreement is. This is perfect agreement. You couldn't expect it even better. And this is an experiment. And so we know that plan B is somehow related to the formation of the active site because it comes after the oxidation into the active state, but it is not the active site itself. Whereas plan C, this is the active site because it correlates exactly with the current. That's nice. So this is, okay, this is useful. The interpretation of this is that is the reaction that is critical. Um, yeah, okay, fine, you form this oxyl species. And here's already written iridium 4 plus delta. So, okay, we have to go a little bit into that because that is, in the scientific literature, that has been debated to death. And I'm not so sure why this is useful to do that, but it has been. Now, a few words on this pseudo-capacity thing. The charge that you store in the system is, of course, not only electrostatic because you see these two blips, but you see also this broad line. This is not electrostatic. But this charge transforms the surface chemistry informs the solid electrolyte interface. That means iridium oxide is transformed into this active thing that you see, and this costs you energy. And this energy comes from while you ramp up the potential. So you prepare the catalyst when you put it into operation. The potential induced oxygen evolution occurs through a surface chemical process. This is this oxyl reacts with water with a rate proportional to the number density of active sites created during activation. That is not exactly the same as electrocatalysis because electrocatalysis tells you the reaction is proportional to the number of electrons that you transfer. Mm, I'm not so convinced that that is right. Because what it says, what we find is electrocatalysis is proportional to the number of active sites that you create while you put the potential of the electrons high enough that they do the reaction. That's not the same thing. 
So, you know, this has been said many times, and there is this little star which says this is the so-called active site, and everybody assumed, and ten, happily assumes, this is the electrode. But I showed you, it's not so simple, and again, this is, I, I, I beat this now to death, I convince you again that this has really something to do with the reaction is, now we do again this potential sweep in, in plot number C down there, and you see we change the potential as you do this with increasing amplitude, and the spectrum of this little peak follows exactly in time what we do with the potential. So we know this is clearly potential induced, this phenomenon. And if you still don't believe it, then we go to theory, and then we make a phase diagram of this system because we know now what the structure is. And then we, we, we ask the theoreticians, what is the concentration of, uh, he, he is called whole quark coverage, but they can also say extent of deprotonation of these two species. And there is one that is double coordinated, and there is a single coordinated one. And one sees beautifully how the concentration of this uh, deprotonated species fits exactly to our potential change. So we know it's this deprotonation of the single coordinated oxygen that makes the active site that does OER. Now, the, the point that I said at the beginning is the reaction is apparently not related to the structure of iridium oxide rutile. Here is the answer, because a single coordinated oxygen is not part of the structure of rutile. There is no single coordinated oxygen in the structure. Ah, okay. This is our critical reaction. No surprise, all surface scientists have said the same thing, but they could not give you the answer. Why is this so? Now, I think we can provide a little bit of the answer. So, is this homogeneous? Yeah, okay, I might get it done. Another very nice opportunity when you do synchrotron spectroscopy is that you can do depth profiling of such a system. So you can change the excitation energy and look deeper and deeper into the bulk. And if you would have a homogeneous electrode, then you would, of course, always get the same spectrum. This is now the iridium spectrum, and you see clearly it's not the same spectrum. And that tells you that the surface of the thing is different than the bulk. Now, having had an electron micro microscope, we know already that is the case. But this is beautiful to see this in operando, also on our specimen that we have in the synchrotron. We see the same thing. And then you can quantify all this, and then you find that the surface is rich in, in iridium-3+. plus. This is this iridium OOH, yes, it should be there. And when you, then you have iridium four plus underneath. And when you look deep into the bulk, you see the iridium metal that comes from the disproportionation of your iridium three plus at the beginning. So everything that I told you, ex situ, we also find apparently in situ when we do this analysis. Okay, it's nothing special, but it is nice to see, yes, there's a complete agreement of this method. So where's the active phase from that? We say, can we still prove that this is really only at the surface? Iridium oxide is a conductor. Yes, this is fine. Iridium OOH is a semiconductor. I showed you all this. Water is bound strongly only to the semiconductor because on metal iridium dioxide, you cannot bind water. You can also verify this if you want to. It's not so easy because you have to clean this iridium oxide surface very well. If it's dirty, then it binds, of course, water like hell. So the working electrodes must be heterogeneous. We said this, so we prepare two electrodes. One, which is a mud crack layer, so this is the standard thing. This contains metal, iridium three plus, iridium four plus. And the other one, number B, which has very tiny nanoparticles of iridium oxide. And the question that we asked ourselves, is this nanoparticle good or bad if you want to make this? And if you have a nanoparticle, then you would say, oh, yeah, the amount of surface atoms is larger than in the bulk, so I would expect if this layer is important, you would expect less iridium, but more activity. Yeah. So when you do this cyclo-voltagram of the things, you don't see much difference, a little bit you see. When you do corona amperometry, you see already way better that this is indeed true. So the good electrode is the one that has the nanoparticles, and the bad electrode is the one that is thick. Okay, but it's within expectation if this is really true that we have this, this core shell structure. Now we do nexus on these systems. This time we look at the iridium because this is now done in high pressure. So this is more than atmospheric pressure with real flow through cells, and we look through the whole flow through cell with our exos. And we see, indeed, there are, there are changes of the, of the position of the uh, iridium line and of, of the iridium absorption, and it depends also how thick this is. And this is interesting. If this is more thin, then you see more of a change. That is normal because the EXAS experiment is in transmission. It's bulk sensitive. If you are interested in the surface, then, of course, from the small particles, you get more surface. So you get a stronger signal. That's all fine. 
that we can quantify all this and then you can determine the oxidation states. And you know very well that from the position of an iridium a white line, you can determine what the so-called formal oxidation state is. And then one finds interesting formal oxidation states, 6.7, 5.7, 4.7. As a chemist, you never believe that oxidation state iridium 6.7. No, never ever on Earth. This is not possible. That tells you how formal is formal, very formal. But there is a difference, and one sees indeed that when we take now this next subspectra, put this in our electronic structure model, and predict the XPS spectrum, then we can make bridging the pressure gap. We do next subs at atmospheric pressure in water, and then we make a prediction what happens in XPS where we have only this one monolayer of water present. And when we do the comparison, we compare this now to the experiments that you see in slide number A, and there's perfect agreement, the most abundant species that we find is a combination of mu1 and mu2 oxygen in its deprotonated state. So I can't beat it any further to death. I think we have complete agreement with everything. Yes, this is our active species. It's only on the surface. Now we can start and think a little bit to the end of the presentation, how does this work? So increasing potential first creates this iridium oxyhydroxide and completely counterintuitive, it produces iridium three plus instead of a higher oxidation state. But that has to do with this possibility of disproportionation rather than oxidation. This is an intrinsic property of the iridium atom, why this is the case. So and this produces this terminal oxygen species and this confines the redox reaction to the top surface layer because in the bulk you cannot, you cannot disintegrate the bulk of this iridium oxide, not at room temperature, as is too refractory. And consequences of this transformation are shifts and in intensity changes in the photoabsorption spectrum. I have shown you in the areas tons of literature, the last five years, more than 100 papers. So many people have studied this phenomenon. And I have shown you there's also a change in the ox oxygen photoabsorption process. This is this little tiny extra peak that has been overlooked by most people. Now we can make a complete model of the reaction. We start with this root tile, and we know it's wrong. But unfortunately, DFT can only do such things. So this is, this is a contradiction to what I told you, but this is the only possibility that we can make a theoretical model at the moment. To do this in clusters is still too complicated. You think it's iridium oxygen. Oh, it's not simple. Okay, what we see is we start with a hydroxylated iridium uh, oxide say, at the far left, and then we gradually deprotonate it until we come to the stage where we have an iridium uh, oxo and an iridium one per oxo species. So we have deprotonated it four times. And of course, if you do the, the reaction, then we go back between the last one and the second one. This is the catalytic cycle that we do. I show you this in another representation in a moment. And you see very clearly what is happening. There's just a gradual removal of protons from this, first from the OH that is in the lattice. This is why people call this a surface lattice uh, oxygen related reaction. But this is terminology for me, so I don't know whether this is a good way of saying it, but that is what the literature says. And once you have done this, then you arrive, at first you remove the, ox the proton from the mu2, that is the bridging oxygen. Then you remove it because it's less stable from the single oxygen. Then you have a wave. then you have this radical, then a water molecule comes, it dissociates, that is normal because two next neighboring systems, this is the previous last step, mu2O, mu1OOH, this is our critical step, and then you deprotonate this hydroperoxo radical and then you have oxygen. That's all perfectly normal. This is standard normal inorganic chemistry. There's nothing special in this. And there's in particular nothing that would justify that this is electrocatalysis. This is any other organic molecule or inorganic system would do exactly the same thing. So when you also look in biocatalysis, there are all kind of peroxidases with copper. They also do exactly this reaction. So the question is also then, is now oxyl the active species or is the iridium 5 plus the active species? That's half semantics, not quite. Because if it is the iridium, then of course first the iridium has to liberate an oxygen, and oxygen reacts with the water. This is this question, is this a so-called mass von Krebelin or langmuir hinchelwood mechanism? These statements are all wrong because this comes from areas that are not applicable to this system. But the literature is full of this and this is why I'm mentioning it. So the dispute, yes there is. So we decided we do this by CO oxidation because the argument is very simple. 
if the, if the iridium high valent would be the critical state, then they would have to release the lattice oxygen. And iridium oxide does not release lattice oxygen at room temperature. We have seen in hydrogen it takes about 70 degrees, but not in water at room temperature. There's no reactivity. If, however, the radical at the surface is the active species that exists at room temperature, so it's immediate reaction. So if you react with CO at room temperature, then it is very likely the oxygen species. If you need to heat this a little bit, then it's very likely the high valent metal species. As the experiment, it's clear it works beautifully well at room temperature. It's a super active CO oxidation catalyst, but no one would make CO oxidation with iridium oxide. That's a little bit too expensive. But it is super active. And what is more interesting in the middle plot I showed you, these are these different catalysts that we made that are more or less active. And the, the capacity of CO oxidation scales very nicely with the capacity to do OER. So we are very confident that this is really the answer. I skip this for reasons of time and go to my previous last slide. Now, what's the formal oxidation state? And I said I hate this word formal oxidation state. I use it in my lectures when I teach undergraduates, but I give them one hour undergraduate lecturing saying this is, this is bullshit, but this is part of our chemical tradition that we call it that way. It, it is a very difficult concept. So literature assigns positive shifts in electron spectroscopy and X-ray absorption to white lines for iridium in an increase in formal oxidation state or what we call deep end hole density. That's also an interesting thing because that comes from, of course, from metal, uh, solid state physics. And then you say, this state has something to do with a band. And so there, there are all kinds of things and pictures are intermixed in order to create this fancy language which is not so clear. And this assumes an electrostatic binding between iridium and oxygen because say, this is the iridium atom, this is the oxygen, there's nothing in between. Otherwise, you can't do that. Others, like us, assign the electron density at oxygen to oxyl. That's also wrong, because we do the same thing. We think this is oxyl, this is an iron, and there's nothing, and then comes the iridium. Both is wrong. The core reason for the excellent suitability of iridium oxide for oxygen evolution is that both statements are wrong. No, they're not wrong. They are boundary assignments. That means in the idea that you would make, um, you put your, your, your I don't know, Shall to say your pink goggles on, and you say you ignore the electron density in between the atoms, then you can do that. This is a boundary condition. But there are no pink goggles in reality, and that's the reason why that's wrong. So there is a very strong structure sensitivity of the valence band, and I showed this to you several times. And this would be very hard to explain if this were electrostatics, because the electrostatics doesn't change as the, the atoms in these lattice between iridium and oxygen are always octahedral, they don't change much. So why should there be such a strong change? This is because the covalency changes, the extent of orbital overlap changes, not the position of the atom. That we can see now in way better um, density of state calculations that we did in the meantime. And this is, of course, at the beginning, at the left side, number C, you see what is the density of states of rutile iridium oxide. And when you look at this, you see this is a very strange density of state plot because you see that the features of the oxygen and the features of the iridium completely overlap in energy. The consequence is that, of course, when you form now a covalent bond, the bonding energy is zero. And that is a very nice explanation why this is so weakly held, because you don't gain anything when you make a covalent bond. You have to have some energy shift in order that you gain, you, you gain some binding energy. And there is no binding energy to gain because all the states are exactly the same energy. So it doesn't matter whether they are there or not. Now, when you make defects in this, and we made strong and large defects, and again, you see this enormous change of the density of states. And that has to do with the fact that, of course, this orbital overlap does change, but the energy distribution does not change. So you see also that the density of states at the Fermi level does change. This is the reason why the metallicity changes. That's also fine. And you see also that the spectroscopy changes because this little extra blip one can see that it disappears when you have too many defects in the system. But the system, the thing prevails that there is no energy gain when you, when you hybridize iridium with oxygen. There's nothing to gain. This is why it's a very weak oxide. So now come my summary slides, two. Function of the iridium oxygen evolution catalyst, the rate limiting step of oxygen evolution is the chemical reaction of water with the oxyl radical. And this is a normal chemical reaction at the interface of the electrode. 
potential generalized determinating layer containing singly coordinated OH and deprotonates it to the oxyl. That is the function of the potential. That has still nothing to do with the oxygen evolution reaction. It creates the active site. And for performance, it is critical that the active layer is very thin because, in, because it is semiconducting, it binds the water, but it hinders, of course, the electron transfer. So the electrode, of course, is not a source of charge carriers as you would ideally assume in the beginning when you do a little bit of theory on this. Uh, or of holes, but it is really, it is a catalytic surface. It is the active layer for a highly specific chemical reaction following a normal langmuir hinchelwood mechanism. And of course, we get, went at great lengths to show that all the kinetics that you measure can be easily explained by langmuir hinchelwood And surface lattice oxygen, a single coordinated species, is the critical structure element, and again, as I said, is not occurring in the structure. This is why Ruthal doesn't do it. The stability of the single coordinated species and its deprotonation potential that you need is orientation dependent. Yes, one can imagine this deposit covalency depends on the relative orientation in space. The electrode material. You need the semiconductor to be contacted to a metallic current collector that is chemically stable against peroxide at pH zero. And what is more stable than rutile with respect to this iridium OOH? That is the reason why you have to have this core shell structure. The iridium oxide rutile is a chemically stable support and collector. It does all what we want, but it does not bind water. All other iridium species, including metal, are chemically unstable and lead to disintegration. So whenever you try to make fancy iridium compounds, you will fail in stability. They are very nicely functional, but only for a couple of minutes. The transformation of rutile or metal to oxyhydroxides must be supported by the defective nanostructure at ambient temperature. This means if you make your electrode and bake it at 600 degrees to make it mechanically stable and you try to activate it, it will not be a good electrode because you have removed the lattice defects of the iridium oxide. Embedding of the active layer plus some functional metallic interface into a redox stable conducting oxide like ATO is possible in order to dilute the iridium. This is what you buy now. When Siemens sells you such an electrolyzer, the electrode is such a TCO doped with iridium oxide. That is how it works. What has been tried in literature is loading the iridium by alloying it, for example, with nickel, with cobalt, with iron, and lots of ideas, with gold, whatever they have tried. That is not stable because it doesn't form this stable interface and all the other alloying elements are more prone to oxidation than iridium itself. So it's always debris on top of iridium that we get and that is why it's not stable. So what did we learn or what possibly maybe I could show you in my very last slide? The combination of operando experimentation and computational spectroscopy, and the combination is important. I think we know now what this star is that comes from this from theory. Surface so science concept of this metal per oxo intermediate, yeah, we also find this and we can confirm this. This is really the difficult step. But we know now how, it's, how it comes about. Because on a metal, you can't have this. The peroxide, what you as chemist would expect is the intermediate, is a very rare intermediate. Also, it's thermodynamically very stable. But for reasons that we have not completely uh, unraveled, I write, write here simply because it is the environment that destabilizes it. It is not found. It's simply not there. The iridium oxygen interaction is covalent and poorly described by this debate about oxidation states. Forget it. The lattice oxygen is electronically close to oxide, so everything is fine underneath the surface. And if you are not surface sensitive, when you do the observation of your system, you will not see this problem because you see just normal oxygen, nothing special. And the coordination number of the oxygen decides over the deprotonation potential. This is single coordinated versus double coordinated. That's also normal in a covalent bond, nothing, nothing spectacular. But the combination of these things in sum is a good explanation why iridium oxide is so good. So this is why it's so good. This is a very simplified reaction mechanism and this is our critical intermediate. If nothing, a chemist would say, why can you talk one hour about this? This is so simple. Yeah, it is simple, but it was not so easy to find it. And it is quite counterintuitive to what you find from surface science experiments. 
you are done. Albert Einstein said, there's no fundamental law requiring simplicity. It's not a good idea to say iridium oxide sounds like root tile, we take root tile, that's probably the same thing. No, it's not. It's all these extrinsic defect specialties and all this rubbish that you normally would like to take away. They make it active. And earlier than Albert Einstein and Leonardo da Vinci said, knowledge is the daughter of experience. So don't make pre-assumptions about such systems, but first look and then think. And don't do it the other way around. Thanks so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Robert, for your nice and inspiring talk. And in the good tradition of British collectors, the paper is open for questions. Okay, please. Yes. Ending uh, up very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, the part which I, I probably missed is the role of water as a reag reagent is clear, but as a, also solvent, because some of these intermediates that you showed, their transition state partly can reside in the water that might also capillary condense or in the, the solvent. So how, how can we uh, comment on that? Yeah, water is, of course. Can I, can I ask you to repeat the question for the record? Ah, yeah, yeah, they can't, they can't. The question was, what is the role of water in this whole system? And I said, it, the whole system doesn't work and is not, is not fully existing in all its complexity if there's no water. So if you put this in OH or in water vapor, it doesn't work. It has to be liquid water. Why? Because indeed, the transition states of everything that I showed, they are strongly solvated. And there are lots of OH groups in it. And there's a lot of hydrogen bonding story in between, which we also studied extensively, but I didn't show for reasons of time. Yes, it is absolutely essential that there is liquid water there. And this is also, you can show why it's so strongly pH dependent, because when you change the pH of this whole system, you change this hydrogen bonding network, and immediately you change also the concentration of the species. Yes, but, so, but, the, but then, then what would happen if even in the vapor phase, there would be some capillary condensation of this water, which might... This depends, become. not in our system. Of course, in real life, if the chemical potential is high enough, then of course it condenses and you don't see any difference. You see then, of course, when you go to performance, then of course you see mass transport limitation. That is easily detectable. You just put a, a, a kind of, um, how do you call this? A, a pH indicator, a color indicator into your electrode and then you see the color change when you put on the current and you can see how the color changes. Because there is mass transport limitation. Yes, a very important problem and that one has to solve by doing the microstructuring of the electrode. That is another story which I also had no time to go into because we do this in collaboration with other partners in Magdeburg in the Max Planck Institute there. There we look into this mesoscopic problem. Yes, it's important, but without molecular water and without hydrogen bridges, it does not work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, can you speak about operando measurements? So, what is actually the time resolution? Okay, that depends. Um, for these experiments that I showed you, we, we, our, the, the time resolution of the spectroscopy is as good as the potential changes across the capacity of our, of, of, of our specimen, also say 10 milliseconds or something. That's good enough. Uh, of course, that has nothing to do with the time scale of chemical reactions. That is a completely different game. But as we do operando experiments, that doesn't help us because if, we, if our stimulus is a change in chemical potential, it doesn't make sense that the spectroscopy is faster than the change of the stimulus. Um, this is why if you ask them, why don't we do this with free electron lasers and look in femtoseconds, so that all has been done. But the important things that I showed you, this is this transformation of the surface you cannot see because that is way too slow. These are processes that happen in minutes and usually, your typical time resolution that you need when you do, a, say, a cyclovoltachromic experiment, that is perfectly fine. You can very easily show by CV that you can be scanning much faster than the electrode can follow it, you know, I you know from all this kinetics. And we can measure anything that you can measure by CV, we can also measure in, in our synchrotron. Okay. Other questions? Sorry? Yeah. Oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Thank you for a nice presentation. It was uh, like inspiring for me actually, because I was really amazed uh, how consistent you were and you put too much energy, time, even money on it. The only problem that I have is like, uh, maybe I, I lost, why iridium oxide and why not metal carbide? Because if I just go through some literature when you were talking and I saw that they claim that the metal carbide could be better than iridium oxide. Thank you. Hmm. How do I answer this? I try to be polite. Um, <laughs> the, the quick and impolite answer is, would these people do a proper chronoampiric experiment They would stop this research? That means what we are interested in is something that lives 50,000 hours. And so the minimum that we do our experiments is 1,000 hours. This is f completely irrelevant for practical application. But I have not seen anything else than iridium oxide that has lived more than 100 hours. So, okay, yes, the electronic structure of some carbides is not too dissimilar from the electronic structure that I showed you. But the big difference is it that this overlap between oxygen and metal is, there is an energy difference. That means if you change the chemical bonding between metal and ligand, then you gain energy. If you gain energy, then of course you also lose energy in the anti-bonding part. Comes the peroxo species, populates this and oxidizes the carbon. That's the end of it. And then it transforms into oxyhydroxide. And many of these things work for a couple of, say, 10 or 20 hours because they are covered by a thin oxyhydroxide layer. But that is normal. You, can, you don't need the carbide for it. Uh, this is also the same story with the sporides that you find in literature, same thing. This is, this is boric acid as a ligand, and then there is an oxyhydroxide covering the whole thing, and that is doing the job. Thank you. Is that a question? Oh, wait for the No, the people who are following us from outside. Robert, your technique is beautifully structure sensitive, so. The question is that it's a tiny system. Those are often li very lively animals changing under conditions. So how stable is the system? Or I can maybe rephrase it. Can you see any restructuring during reaction? Or can you see beam effects in terms of solvated electrons? Yeah, yeah, of beam effect in, 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 in terms of uh, heating up the solvation shell? Uh, it could be many, many questions. Oh, you can see all of these fancy things. And this is the reason why it took us 10 years to measure that and not just one experiment. Um, the first thing what you do is just burn the whole thing with a normal synchrotron beam. So you can't see any performance. This is why I showed this slide. You have to come to the quality of experiment that you can switch on your potential and switch off your potential and you see that the oxygen is changing. That took us about eight years until the experiment <laughs> was there that we saw in the mass spectrometer the change of the potential. That is extremely critical, yes. But scientifically speaking, of course, there is also there is some time where this whole system rearranges. And the, 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 the steady state of the system is this iridium oxyhydroxide termination layer with this holandite motif, and then comes some iridium oxide underneath this current collector. And this takes some time to evolve. This depends on how well you prepare this typical time scale, one hour. That is why when you do a cyclovoltomogram at the beginning and then you say to one or two hours chronoamperometry and do another cyclovoltomogram, then you see there's a difference. That's well documented in the literature. And this is because then the system became from a green catalyst that had some things on the surface and still a lot of wrong structure in the bulk into something that is steady state. And of course, this, this uh, Hollandite motif, this is of course also wobbling. This is like a glass or a gel. This is nothing rigid. The, the rigid picture that you got was only because when we put it in the microscope, it was co completely dehydrated. If you would rehydrate it, then you can't see anything. We have tested this. We put in the electron micrograph wa in microscope water, and what we see is you lose the contrast completely because this is a gel now. I, in the time resolution that we have, we do not see a static structure anymore. So this is really, this is a wobbling thing in reality. Uh, thank you. Um, if, I, if I understood it correctly, uh, chasing after the uh, perfect iridium dioxide rutile structure is actually um, the step into the wrong direction because the inherent um, uh, catalytic activity comes from the influencing defects and um, misfits, structural defects, and so on. So um, if the actual substachyometry or this behavior leads to better activity, what do you think about the going the other way around and starting with the pure metal and let it naturally 
oxidize towards the active state. It works perfectly well. No problem. You only have to do this often enough. You can take a bulk iridium wire or a lithium foil, and when you cycle it about 500 times, then you see it transforms from metallic to blue, and when it's blue, it's exactly the same thing that we have here. It works fine. We also do this all the time because we sputter iridium on our specimen and then we pre-activate it. I simply haven't shown this. Um, we and others have published papers on this. We also did the grazing incidents extra diffraction where we saw how this thing changes in the surface. The, yeah, it, it, you can easily start from iridium metal. And, and why is it, or is it being done routinely or because no. You, in practice, you make these materials, as I showed you, do a precipitation from this iridium chloro species, and this forms this mixture, this, this disproportionation mixture between metal and oxide, and then comes the, the top secret part is, you give this some thermal treatment that is good enough in order to hide all the metal because that is unstable, and convert everything that is in the interlayer space to oxide, but do not crystallize the thing to rutile. Thank you. I can tell you it's about 225 degrees in about 20% of water. This is the, the secret mixture that you're using. Do this for four hours and it's a perfect system. Further you will questions? find out very quickly yourself. Further questions, comments? Not much of an interest. Can I ask one question myself? It's a Thank you. For the record, right? Actually, I was, I was excited to see how nicely you've shown that oxidizer solid material is not a simple thing of oxidizing a simple component, which was a nice thing. But what we know for ages in experimental electrocatalysis, when the people played with different oxides, we know that to a certain extent, different electrodes really do exchange the oxygen. So something what used to be in the, in the electrode comes in the form of, of dioxygen, yeah. either one, in some cases, both oxygen atoms come from what used to be the electrode. I'm not claiming that this is a lattice oxygen activation, yeah. as some people use in the wrong way. But if I look at the samples you, you've shown here, MW5 to MW100, you claim that you have a different amount of oxyl. I would expect that these materials will also change their behavior with respect to the isotopic formation in this, in this case. Do. And the more of oxyl, I would expect that the more of a lattice what is described as a lattice oxygen exchange, or erroneously, like Mars van Krevelen, would be increasing. Is that uh, the case? We have published exactly that in 2017 or something. Yes, it yes. is exactly. Of course, we did all these isotope studies. This yeah, I, I know. Um, and <laughs> the answer is exactly the same. The isotope activity is direct proportional to the, to the OER activity, and this comes simply because if you do what I have shown and you make this single crystalline, uh, this, this single coordinated oxygen, there is as a rare event, of course, the single coordinated thing just dis disappears with its neighbor and there's a hole formed and then yeah. comes the isotope labeling there. This is a rare event. That is the reason why it's not instantaneous. You can follow the time schedule and the amount, uh, the extent and the amount uh, of, of isotope label that you get depends on the activity, of course. It, the rare event happens more often if there is more turnover. Perfect. More questions, comments? No? Not interesting. I'm no, no, it's that. pretty much interesting, but the people are probably shy. So let me to thank on your behalf our illustrious speaker again. And <laughs> if Martin allows me to make a little announcement on his behalf, the event is not over and uh, you're all cordially invited for informal talk with a glass of wine and a little snacks in the lobby here. So the Robert Schlegel will be available. So if you have any questions, feel free to approach him. And I'm looking forward to see you all there. Thank you. <laughs>